Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We cover one topic related to e-commerce, and we always have a very exciting panel. Uh, and today also we have some uh, very compelling guests. Uh, who are joining us for the first time, specifically for this episode. And you have some people who you might have seen in the past. For today's topic, we are going to be talking about pricing strategies. And this is related to our other topic that we have covered in the past. If you have not checked out, I would highly recommend checking that episode out. Uh, it was related to discounting strategies. We are going to be covering the differences in those two in this episode, and we are going to build a lot more on the pricing. So without further ado, we are going to start with everybody's intro. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm going to guess you picked me because I had the biggest wise cracking grin at that moment. So uh, my name is Steve Rice uh, from Dotcom Jungle and the Globally Conscious Leader. And uh, with Dotcom Jungle, we work in conjunction with the often siloed marketing, finance and technology departments to uh, make and implement wise technology choices uh, that benefit all their stakeholders. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. Your experience is going to be so beneficial for today's panel. Uh, Eric, can I move to you next for your intro? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Eric Landman. I'm the e-commerce division manager of Earthling Interactive. We are a development company. We're building uh, e-commerce sites and web apps for quite a variety of company uh, companies and markets. We don't specialize in any particular thing. About half for B2B and about half for B2C. And I've I've I'm a Magento certified solution specialist. I've been involved in building about 50 sites out. Also have done some stuff in Shopify and a bunch of other platforms too over the years. And uh, enjoy what I'm doing. Okay, amazing. It's always a pleasure to have you always, uh, Eric, on these panels. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, Dave Meyer, can I move to you next for your introduction, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. This is Dave from BusyWeb. So excited to be here for you today, Sam and team. We're um, BusyWeb is a growth marketing agency that works in the manufacturing and B2B services space. We help drive traffic to our customers. We help them convert traffic through marketing optimization and enablement and sales enablement programs to help you get your leads and convert your leads into real business. Thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Okay, amazing. It's always a pleasure to have you, Dave. Thank you so much for joining today. And uh, David Chrysler, I know you have been super kind today in uh, picking the name David uh, for today. I know that we have a little confusion in the room with two days. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Sam. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chrysler, and I own a company called the Chrysler Club, where we work with business owners to help them create the systems they need to get them to stop working in their business. I spent more than 20 years in the manufacturing space uh, in operations directly and have worked with several other small business owners uh, in terms of building out their e-commerce and have had many a pricing strategy conversations. So excited to get into this. Thanks for having me, Sam. It's always fun to hang out with you, Dave, and I am super excited to have you for the first time on this series. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, Colin, can I move to you next for your introduction? Absolutely, thanks, Sam. So my name's Colin and I'm a partner at Omnium. So we're an analytics modeling and strategic council firm. And we work with a lot of CPG brands, a lot of brick and mortar as well as online. And we support primarily the sales and finance functions. 
So pricing has been a conversation that all of our clients are having uh, right now. And uh, with our mathematical background, it's, it's a conversation I really enjoy having too. Yeah, and on this panel, Colin, we typically like to stick to facts, but today it's going to be at a different level uh, with your insight uh, you know, from your data background. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, All right. Sam. So we are going to dig right into the topic, and this is going to be, number one, we are going to understand the difference between pricing and discounting, because not sure if everybody really understand where each of them are going to be fit, because at the end of the day, if you think about pricing and discounting, uh, you know, you are trying to help customers save money. Yes. Right. But I mean, you know, each of them has their own applications. So first, we are going to understand the difference between those two strategies and where they each are going to be applicable. And when then we will dig deeper into the pricing strategies. So, Steve, I'm actually going to start with you again. OK, so tell us the differences between pricing and discounting strategies. And what is the real difference? I mean, how would you define, let's say, if somebody does not know where they should be considering the pricing change or price reduction versus applying a discount? Well, a pricing strategy is really the mechanism by which you're stating your value to the customer. And uh, a discounting strategy is the mechanism by which you devalue that, that uh, value that you've just stated. Um, that would be the main difference, I think. Inside pricing strategies, you have a lot of uh, names of things, ways to go about it. Uh, and in your original post uh, on LinkedIn to announce this, you named most of them. And I'm going to rip through them really quick for everybody because you've got cost plus pricing, competition based or competitive pricing, value based pricing, price skimming, loss leader pricing, which is not discounting uh, unless you do it wrong. Um, and penetration pricing, which is also not discounting unless you do it wrong. Dynamic pricing, bundle pricing, which is a form of discounting. Uh, and sort of the name speaks for itself, you bundle items together. And then you have premium discounting and anchor uh, anchor pricing, which is anchor, it looks like discounting where you say regularly 99.95, yours today for 89.95. Uh, also done properly is not discounting, it's actually a pricing strategy. Um, so that might be the best way to kick this off is to throw all of those out there. Um, and the one thing I would say at the list of all of those is that at the very beginning, when people start businesses, uh, especially if they make something out of something else, whether it's plastic, metal, wood, whatever, the, the most common type of thinking is cost plus, where you basically say the wood cost me $14. It cost me $8 to whittle it. Uh, it cost me four dollars to ship it and i need to make this much when i'm done so i'm taking the cost i'm plussing some stuff on top of it and then i'm selling it um, that also could be the least sophisticated way of pricing but it also can be very effective um, unless you don't review your costs uh, regularly so with that i think that's a good jumping off point for the rest of the group uh, i hope and if not then you guys can uh, throw me under the bus <laughs> okay, amazing. So obviously, we'll be digging uh, deeper into all of those pricing types that you mentioned. I think they all are going to have their own specific applications. But we are going to set the stage a little bit more uh, in terms of the differences between pricing and discounting strategies. Uh, so Eric, I'm actually going to move to you because you bring a very interesting perspective to the panel, uh, which is going to be slightly more technical and development, development perspective. So let's say if I am speaking technically, pricing is going to be a very different, uh, you know, application versus the discounting. So from your perspective, what is the real difference between pricing and discounting? Well, <clears throat> pricing sets the base price that a user will see when they come into the site, and it might be determined by user groups or uh, other factors, perhaps corporate purchasing contracts, or if you're a B2B site, it might be a special price list that is generated. Uh, that doesn't mean it's necessarily discounted. A discount is usually used in business to consumer sites, like when you go to buy a widget from wherever and you're shopping for the widget, you go to Google Shopping and you see 15 different prices there and somebody's, you know, you know what the list price is, but they're all discounting at different levels. Uh, the 
the pricing models that I've been exposed to are primarily with manufacturers. They start with cost plus, but then, then they get complicated really fast because for example, we have a customer that uses, they, they build um, industrial equipment and the steel prices just went crazy in the last year and a half. So they were getting steel from China and then they couldn't get steel from China. So it just went, it, it like went up 30 to 40% within a few months. They're building units that are 10 to $20,000 a piece. Steel is a big component of that. So they can't do cost plus. They have to look at, look at um, other pricing strategies. So in that case, they, they, look, at, um, they look at the market-based pricing, who their competitors might be doing because they're manufacturing things too. And so, you know, it gets really complicated super fast. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is maybe jumping ahead a bit, is that when you when management considers what to do with pricing strategies, uh, if they're representing these on a, a website uh, in some customer-facing uh, method, uh, you have to consider how many levels of rules, business rules that are applied to the pricing. Like you can have a user group, you might have a special contract pricing, you might have a volume discount over time, you may have a discount if they prepay. If you start stacking all of these factors on top of each other, at, at, and then you talk to your developer about it, their head is gonna explode. It's like, whoa, what, what is all this stuff? There's just too much going on here because you can have some really strange unintended consequences so uh, this management and marketing i think tend to come up with ideas that, that are creative and but sometimes they can't be implemented so easily so you need you need to talk to the development team about how um, complex these pricing strategies are and then discount one more thing discount might be off the top of that so to make this even more crazy let's just say your potential customers showed up at a trade show everybody remembers what those were from back in the day <laughs> they show up at a booth and they get a they get a, a special discount code for uh five hundred dollars off this industrial equipment i mean that's a pure discount you use a code so but does that come where does that discount get applied does it get does it get applied before shipping or after shipping or to the wholesale cost or or where so i mean these are all factors that that come into play here, it can get kind of crazy. I hope I didn't blow your minds there. <laughs> <laughs> so some amazing insights there. And Eric, uh, you know, you may have contradicted you, with yourself successfully because initially you mentioned that, you know, what discounts are really for B2C, but then you yeah. provided a lot of examples for B2B well, as well. That's so. <laughs> true. <laughs> so the discounts are equally... Yeah, yeah, discounts are definitely applicable for B2B. Uh, yeah. Sales people would not be able to meet their numbers uh, if they did not have, uh, let's say, the end of the quarter discounts uh, or end of the year discounts. So discount, discounts are definitely, definitely applicable. The reason why you see um, the discounts more commonly in the B2C space is because in most cases, discounts are probably going to be affiliated with a coupon code. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you talk purely from the accounting perspective, accounting does not understand coupon. Um, so when you talk about the one-to-one the -one correlation between your coupon and discount, probably coupons are nothing but your discounts uh, in the accounting terms. Um, so uh, typically pricing does not really have a code that is going to be public facing. It may have a code uh, inside your system, uh, but you are not gonna have a public facing pricing code uh, that you bring this code and then I'm actually going to give you this special price. You give them a special price because it could be because of uh, either uh, based on a zip code, a location, warehouse, uh, you know, it could be a customer group, yep. loyalty, the scenarios that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Dave, I'm actually going to move to you next. Uh, from your perspective, you know, what is the real difference between pricing and discount? Do you agree, disagree with whatever has been said so far? Yeah, Sam, thank you. The The big difference between pricing strategy and discount strategy is one word, fear. If you're not set in your 
businesses pricing. And this, this is different between B2B and B2C, of course. And if you're not measuring to make sure that you understand the impact of your pricing and making sure that you're actually moving the needle and responding appropriately, then you need to take advantage of those first. But the first thing that you need to really think about is what is that value that you're bringing to any, in any interaction? And you know, we, we just got done talking about coupon strategies. That's part of marketing, right? What you're trying to do is gather people's attention and pricing is one of the most important ways to do that. Amazon has always led from a price competitive standpoint and they, they just, they drive the, the every nickel out of, out of any, any interaction. And so they just kind of pull everything down and that's the power of really knowing your numbers. But if you don't take it back and really think about it, especially in B2B, which is where I kind of want to kind of want to level because we work mostly in manufacturing and B2B services. If you're not really thinking about what your pricing says about your product or especially your service, you need to take a hard look at what that is. I did this when I was starting BusyWeb, you know, 1999. I was starting BusyWeb and there was all kinds of stuff out there. And so I was doing like $500 websites, baby, you know, anything that I could do. And the, the sad truth is that a $500 website and a $50,000 website often pretty much have exactly the same needs and are, are, and are going to require exactly the same amount of time to build them. The only difference is you're going to be a lot skinnier at the end of doing one than the other, right? So you, you need to step up and to really think about what you're doing. So if, and, and let me just lean into the services space for one second, because that's where I live take a little bit of time and just test out doubling your pricing. Just give it a shot, see what happens. And you might want to do this to a landing page where you're just going to do an A-B test, do an advertisement against your product, your service for a thing, and then just try it. Like one for $5,000, one for $10,000 and see where you're at and see where the value is inside of that. So there's, there's so much inside of here. And, you know, Steve did a really great job of rounding up all of the stuff that you put into the, the write up. But, you know, there's, if, if you're looking at cost plus you're, you're looking at com competition in a commodity based business. Right. Um, but the rest of them competition value, um, and especially dynamic and premium pricing are where you can really set your brand and set people's minds in the space that they're actually going to value your product, your service more because you charge more for it. It's just a psychological shortcut, right? If I'm paying for something, I know that it's of more value than what anything else might be. So if you have two products of equal or similar display, dis, displacement, the one that's more expensive is going to be seen as higher quality and the one that's less expensive is probably going to be tougher to engage with, depending on the kind of people that you're working with. So what I'm saying, Sam, is that I'm all over the board on this dang pricing thing. And the reason that I am is that you always need to work back from measuring what you're getting and if your pricing strategy is working for you, because there's no separation between pricing and marketing your business. Okay, some amazing insights there and could not agree more. And uh, I think fear is really the summary of pricing. A lot of marketers, they don't like to charge, uh, you know, for their services just because they are afraid of charging them and they are afraid of losing business and losing market share and they are never mm -hmm. going to try. And <laughs> so that's definitely the case. By the way, I would love to see that $500 website. I don't know how that appeared. Uh, oh, I don't if know you if go back. <laughs> If you go back in, in the Wayback Machine, you're going to see some crappy websites that I created when it was just me. There's a reason I've hired a lot of people because I suck as a designer, but I'm okay as a, as a business owner. So You would probably uh, make a really good LinkedIn post with before and after. You got uh, it. You got it. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. So, David Chrysler, you know, I'm actually going to move to you from your perspective, obviously, um, you have uh, you have worked in a lot of you know traditional businesses as well, and obviously the pricing was your tool when you had to meet your number when you have to have that PL uh, responsibility. 
So from your perspective, what are some specific applications that you have seen from the pricing and discounting perspective and which were more effective pricing or discounting when you were trying to meet your numbers? Well, from my standpoint, Sam, it is really a combination effort between, you know, what's the strategy in terms of cost plus, what's the strategy from a sales and marketing perspective uh, to get you where you want to be in the marketplace. And I think, you know, Dave and Eric, you guys both did a really good job of kind of laying that out in terms of, you know, monitoring the testing of that. Um, the majority of the manufacturing facilities that I've been into, Eric, to your point, start off with cost plus, but I really look at it as a hybrid model because you're doing cost plus, uh, especially in, in a manufacturing environment that has a fully integrated ERP where you're used to that. You're applying, uh, in some cases, standard costing, and then you are also doing a competitive analysis and market testing. And throughout your marketing and sales cycles, you are probably doing some discounting, testing, and or anchor pricing, depending on what types of products you're manufacturing and or just selling um, if you are, you know, a distributor, let's say. So my approach is, you know, it's it's a, it's multifunctional and it is typically going to be a hybrid approach that gets you to the best place that kind of satisfies all of the different areas that you're trying to check off. Sam, to your point, to be able to hit the numbers um, without that monitoring and testing and, uh, you know, going being able to go back to, Eric, you brought up about the supply chain and that impacting and material pricing without all those um, factors coming into play and looking at it from the macro and how each one of them impacts, it's going to be really hard to just say line in the sand, we're going straight cost plus or we're going straight, um, you know, uh, going straight value based, let's say. And, you know, Dave, back to your kind of example in a, in a, in a service based business it's easy to do that in, in more of a manufacturing space. It's more challenging to do that. You have other requirements that you're trying to satisfy, especially if you're, um, you know, responsible from a P and L standpoint. So, um, you know, hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of insight into some of the things that I've had to, uh, navigate in the past, Sam. Okay. Some amazing insights there. And you are absolutely right that pricing is definitely going to be an experiment. You cannot really, uh, you know, firm your mind on a specific strategy and just rely on that, that this is going to work. You really need to try, even if you don't have the technology and tools available uh, at your fingertips to be able to do the A-B testing, you need to do A-B testing in the old fashioned way. Uh, but you definitely do need to do the, the, the testing. So thank you so much for that insight. Uh, Colin, I'm actually going to move to you. I'm pretty sure you are going to have fascinating data points uh, overall from the pricing and discount per discounting perspective. So what's your perspective? Do you agree or disagree with anything that has been said so far? Uh, what's your perspective on pricing versus discounting? Yeah, um, definitely draw a pretty strong distinction between the two. Um, I think when you say pricing, I like to think of that as the everyday pricing. So if you walk into a store, stumble up upon a website, right, that's the price you're going to see. And then uh, discounting is the way that you try and drive incremental units or volume. So there's so many different ways, right, that we can discount. Um, now, one thing when we talked about cost plus, right, that's, I think that's often the starting point and the reason that I think it's the starting point is that um, we tend to know what our P&Ls look like, what the margin is that we need to be able to run a business. And so cost plus is guaranteed to get you to that starting point. Um, and then the fun starts, right? You get to start experimenting with what if we, what if we move pricing up and down, right? If I lower my price a little bit, am I getting, am I driving more units or not? If I bring my price up, am I actually losing volume? And so I like to think about playing with pricing as, as a game or an experiment. Um, so coming back to what Dave said about getting measurements, right? You're not gonna know what price you can be at until you start to play the game of pushing it up and down. Now, um, if you're say selling something in a store or selling something B2B, that's 
probably harder because you don't have as many plays of a game. But in the online space, the great thing is that you can change your price weekly or daily or serve up different prices to different people. So you have this really rich environment in which to run experiments. And there's really no cost, no real cost to making changes on the fly and learning. Um, so I recommend this approach a lot of like really, really experiment, play with pricing. Uh, that, that, the double your price thing is, is genius, right? Play the game. Can I double my price? Can I quadruple my price? What are consumers telling me about the value of my brand based on their reaction to my different prices? And then um, the way I think that this can interact with discounting as well is, is at, the, at the end of the day, um, when you take into account pricing, so the, the volume that you sold not on promotion or discount, and then discounting and, and the volume you sold there. When you blend those together, you get to what I like to call a net effective price or a net unit cost. And if you know that your PL needs um, a cost plus of, or let's say you need a 30% margin to be able to keep the lights on, uh, there's a lot of ways to get there with combinations of discounting and, and pricing. So, you can play with those net prices, right? Try a, a, a higher margin, a lower margin on, on promotion and off and get to the same point. It does get confusing, right? That we talked about earlier um, with all those different layers of promotions. But if you can get to the end, what is my uh, net price that I'm selling it for? After I wait all these different tactics, then you know that you've protected yourself and your p &L and that you can run profitably. And then you just had this fantastic environment to run all kinds of, of experiments and uh, really learn what drives your business. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, so some amazing points there. Number one, obviously the cost plus uh, is always going to be the starting point because as mm -hmm. Dave Meyer said that, you know what, in initially everybody is going to be super fearful about their business. And the more fearful you are, the more cost plus you are going to do because you cannot go any lower than that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so any businesses that are not going to be, uh, you know, know or understand their business really well, or their competitive landscape really, really well, or know their uh, products and, and and services and know how to price them well, most likely they are going to choose the the cost plus uh, you know strategy, and that is probably the most common, especially if you talk about some of the traditional businesses, for example, manufacturers. I can almost guarantee that 80% of the manufacturers are probably going to price based on cost plus. Now think about this, guys, how much money you are losing just because you don't know how to experiment. You don't have tools and technologies to be able to experiment, to be able to find out what you might be able to charge. So some amazing points there. And obviously, you know, once you have the tools and technologies to be able to experiment, to be able to draw the trend historically, and again, the pricing is not going to be, you know, you you experiment just in one month and, you know, set and forget. It doesn't work that way. You need to be able to analyze the trends. You need, uh, you know, a lot more data points, uh, data points related to different geography, data points related to different customer groups. The more data points that you have, the more relevant pricing you are going to be able to propose uh, to your specific customer groups. And the more, uh, you know, micro customer groups you have, uh, the, the higher chances you are going to get that you will be able to uh, charge for more because if you are going to charge universal price across the board, most likely some of the customers are not going to be happy uh, about it. Uh, so the more experimentation, the more data points that you have, the more uh, you know you will be able to uh, 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 get far more margin, obviously, you know, from your product offering. So now we are going to dig deeper into those uh, you know pricing types. Uh, we have a lot of different pricing types. They are relevant in each specific industry in each specific uh, product offerings uh, one specific strategy that might be applicable in a specific product category may not be relevant in the other one um, so steve i'm actually going to move to you uh, you know i know that we have many different categories such as you know your cost plus your uh, you know competition based uh, you have value based so i don't know if you're going to have any specific stories that you might be able to share uh, or just talk about the pros and cons 
of those approaches and where uh, they should be utilizing all of these strategies in which business type uh, and the product offerings. Okay. Well, I, I have one story uh, that can sort of talk to you, talk to the, uh, the manufacturer or the retailer who is afraid to raise their prices. Uh, and I, I've told this in a different way uh, in the past on other panels, and I'm going to try and keep this one short. But essentially, the, the math that I have done and, and the actual real life uh, working out of this math has uh, um, validated it, uh, is that if you uh, increase your margin by 10% for whatever product that you have, and this is, these are all products that basically generally have between a 40 and 50 margin, uh, so if you're working in that environment, the that extra, say, five bucks that you put uh, at the end of a hundred dollar product, because you bought it for 50 bucks, your margin is 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 a hundred percent. Right. Uh, and so um, if you take one hundred and ten percent margin, m multiply your your 50 bucks by one hundred ten, you're selling it for one hundred and five. Right. So that five bucks goes into the company's pocket, the owner's pocket. And the the question that we asked a long time ago is, well, how much, how many customers do I have to lose before I actually lose money? Um, so we're not taking into account how many customers am I going to anger, uh, you know, but we're assuming those are sort of the same thing. And that number is actually somewhere around 60% of you, your sales have to go down a huge number. Um, it's well over 50 for you to lose money uh, increasing your margin by 10% on a product that averages between 40 and 50. So just put that in, in your pipe and, and smoke it overnight and let me know what you think. Then as far as your answer about what's best for people to use, I think we're all sort of in agreement here that most people start, most companies, especially manufacturers, start with the cost plus. Um, and in reality, um, well, that's a horrible way to start a sentence as if there is no reality. But uh, I think what's true, let me put it this way, is that a company, the more sophisticated a company becomes, regardless of whether they make a widget uh, or, you know, a technology widget or a manufactured widget, the more of these strategies they actually put in place. And, and they're not afraid of any of them. Uh, so each one has its own pros and cons. And, uh, you know, you did ask to talk about them. And maybe I'll mention a few and let other people talk about others. Uh, but they, they all have a place in your business generally. And I'm not, not to say that all of them actually have a place in every business, but every business has more than one of these they should be using. Um, so just to give an example, uh, maybe let's talk about, um, I'm looking down the list here, loss leader pricing. This is actually something you see every day. Uh, you'll see a company, and one of my favorite stories is a company that sold, they, they were selling into the hook and bullet crowd. Um, people who, who buy a lot of handguns, they wear a lot of uh, American flag shirts. There's very much a, a, an ethos that goes along with it. Um, and they're, a lot of them are preppers, right? They, they're, they're getting ready for the apocalypse. And so they're selling to that crowd. Well, they went and bought a bunch of windproof, waterproof lighters. And they got them for basically like two or three bucks. And that was their last leader. They, they basically sold into the prepper crowd. They targeted them on Facebook and they lost money. It cost them two or three dollars to market to each of those people. Uh, they were playing with their conversion rates all along the way. But their their concept was we want as many email addresses of people who think like this as possible. Because what we really want to do is sell them a T-shirt. They really were a T-shirt company. And uh, in that story, they, they, if you just took the sales of their, uh, that lighter, um, they lost millions. But that lighter, even in the initial purchase, they actually made money because something like 22% of the people who bought that lighter also bought a $3 t-shirt for 30 bucks. <laughs> so not everybody can do that. If, if you're a high quality manufacturer of drills, you, you can't take an angle like that. Um, so um, that's just an, a, one, one story, one example of how something like that could work for a company. 
Okay, so some amazing stories and insights there, Steve. Uh, and uh, I'm actually going to have a clarifying question for you, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, and that is going to be related to your comment related to losing the customers. Uh, so if you obviously work in a business where, let's say, if you have a lot of existing customers, uh, then you have a different problem versus when you are trying to acquire the newer customers, the price sensitivity of the newer customers are going to be very different from the existing customers. And obviously we all know that price is not the only factor why people shop. When we are going to be looking at the existing customers, they are going to be looking at a lot more factors than price alone. But if you are going to uh, be working on the newer customers, then the price sensitivity is going to be very different because they don't know you, they trust you, they are coming for the first time. Uh, their price sensitivity is going to be higher. So when you were looking at, let's say, how many customers do you lose? Did you also look at, uh, you know, how many newer customers uh, you end up not acquiring? Or was acquiring newer customers wasn't a problem with this specific business? Uh, it wasn't a problem with this specific business. It, it was a, a, a company uh, that presented a high value and a high quality product. Um, and I, I, you know, we like to try and have some data for this panel. And I read an article about 10 years ago that it, by a, a very important organization that I can't remember, I couldn't find it, that actually showed in, in their data, it was a very large data set, that only 26% of the people who shop on the web, so this must have been about 2011, actually care primarily about the price. Right. And so the, the I wholly agree with your sentence. Like there's a lot of other things that, people take into account. And I think that if you went around and asked most people, including people who sit on our end, inside industries working with, you know, as consultants, if you ask them how many people care about the price when they're shopping, I, I bet most people would pick a number over 50%. Um, and it's, I don't think it's actually true. So value gets perceived in a lot of different ways. Uh, and price is is actually primarily one of them. And that doesn't mean that it's an inhibitor to the sale. It means that it's a value modifier, a perception modifier. If I, uh, if I went to Patagonia's website and I saw a $99 puffy, um, and then I went to Arcteryx's website and saw a similar puffy for $199, I have two choices. I either think, well, Arcteryx's must be better or uh, Patagonia's uh, must be discounting or something, right? Um, and if you're, if you are a quality manufacturer or quality retailer, and your brand, you've done all your other branding pieces. You, you've talked to Dave at Busy Web, and all your marketing pieces are in place, and so you don't look like a discounter. Then people are going to expect it to be one ninety nine, and and if you don't see it at one ninety nine, they actually might leave. So, so you can run into both, Sam, uh, in that regard, in terms of pricing. Um, so you bring up a good point, and uh, it can go both ways if you don't, you know, pricing strategy is really important for, for establishing your place in the marketplace. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. Awesome insights, uh, Steve. Uh, so Eric, I'm actually going to move to you next. And uh, obviously, when you are working with these strategies, if your customers are going to ask, hey, I am looking for a website, and the only thing I'm going to do is cost plus pricing strategy. Your life is going to be much easier. But we know that it doesn't end there, right? Uh, no. You know, so so each time you are going to get a change request related to a pricing strategy, that's when you know that they are going to have some sort of changes in their pricing in their market. So in your experience, what are some of the instances where you have seen these changes in pricing when you are getting these requests uh, from the client and which one you have seen working in your experience? Uh, well, we build the tools that allow the, the customer to manipulate their own pricing and do their own testing. But I can give you an example, a real life example from this industrial manufacturer about how they use pricing. Um, they start with a cost plus. This is the same example of the people who are using the steel. Um, but then they look, they, they don't look so much at competition based pricing. They're kind of a mid tier provider of these products. They are competing with some really huge companies who could just you know, squash them if they wanted to with price. Uh, but they instead have evolved 
to use value-based pricing. Now, this company has been around since 1930-something, so I don't know what their website looked like in 1930, but probably not the same as today. Um, <laughs> so they use, but they, 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 uh, their pricing goes into proposals, and this equipment will last many, many years. So they sell the value-based proposition as as a, a way to avoid maintenance costs and a way to avoid a lot of hassles. So the, the tools that we give them are the ability to do change projects, pr uh, products on a bulk basis or uh, set price lists for particular corporate entities so that the branches can buy, uh, you know, so somebody like a plumber, a plumbing distributor who might be national, they would be a customer. So the national company gets price schedules, but they're also tweaked regionally. So uh, a plumber in Texas gets a different price than a plumber in, uh, say, California, because it's way more expensive in California. Even though they manufacture this stuff in the Midwest, they add on the shipping. So, But the base price is different. Um, so that's that's the strategy that they use for sure, and that you know that's it's pretty pretty well evolved. And this, by the way, is a company that uses manufacturers reps. You cannot buy their products just on on the website. You can ask for a quote, and they may adjust the quote. The sales rep may adjust the quote, but I, I'm not um, familiar with the intimate workings about that. But these are the tools that they use on their site. Yeah, some amazing insights there. And by the way, if any companies are going to be using wraps, obviously commission is going to be a big component there. Uh, you know, yeah. that is going to drive uh, how much pricing or, or what pricing they are going to get. And obviously right. the commission is going to be different in California versus uh, versus your Texas uh, because the cost of living is different at each places. So exactly. some great points there. Yeah. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. So Dave, I'm actually going to move to you next, uh, Dave Meyer. Uh, so, uh, in your case, obviously you are running in the trenches right there when you are doing these campaigns, when you are sending these coupons and you are monitoring these results, right? So from your experience, what are different pricing strategies that you have seen, uh, working for your clients? And I don't know if you're going to have any specific stories, uh, or any unique pricing scenarios, uh, that you have seen that have not been covered with the other panelists so far. Yeah, there's, there's a couple that I'd like to highlight. One is that discounting isn't always your first method in in adjusting your price performance so another thing that you might want to consider are bundling or adding additional services or adding value to an interaction so if there's conversation that you're having especially in these bigger conversations with larger b2b pricing um, a lot of times the conversation in a sales engagement will focus on the bottom dollar, right? But if you're a salesperson or if you're in marketing and you're trying to bring people along to accept your pricing, you need to incorporate all the other things that go into that pricing decision. So if I provide a product that's a little bit more expensive, but that will last twice as long, as the competitor, then I'm saving my customer money in the long run, right? So if I can have that conversation and get them into that mode, then they understand the value of my pricing. The other side, when you're looking at opportunities for discounting, and sometimes discounting is absolutely fine to do and a good business um, opportunity, is think about the cost per acquisition of new customers. If it costs you, let's say, $10,000 to acquire a new customer, you have anything less than that money to get additional customers. So you can afford to dip a little deeper into your pricing and maybe sometimes even into a lost leadership position if it gets you the customer, like in Steve's example. I think it was Steve that had the T-shirt example um, to sell all of those additional T-shirts. So they brought you in and then they brought it back across right so for us and for our clients what we like to try to do is how much additional value can can you make it's worth spending money and time on your brand and on your trust factors in order to give yourself give yourself more price elasticity 
right? So if people understand the value that you bring and if they're bought in to that you are the solution to their problem, they're willing to pay more. And then also just bringing it back and saying, you know, this is a direct line from the value that you get to what you're paying. And as long as I can cover that spread between what I'm charging and what the value is to my customer, and they understand that within my brand, then I'm golden and you're going to keep growing. Okay, amazing. So I'm actually going to have one clarifying question for you, Dave, as well, uh, just to connect the dots for our listeners. Um, so when you mentioned, and a lot of you have mentioned the example of Lost Leader, uh, and that could be slightly more technical term for a lot of people who might not be familiar with this specific pricing strategy. So obviously in the sales term, uh, most people understand, you know, what land and expand is, uh, you know? So land and expand is going to be, you try to discount your product or services heavily to be able to land in the account. Uh, and then you are either trying to increase uh, your offerings or trying to sell more, or next time you are going to be up for renewal, you are probably going to pay the amount that I was hoping you would pay. Mm -hmm. um, that's typically the lending. So is it similar uh, to your lost leader or is lost leader going to be different than your landed friend? Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit different, but okay. it can be used the same way, right? So a, as long as you've got a customer that's bought in on the value of your service and you've done the homework to make okay. sure that you represent yourself as worth that cost, yeah, then you have a little bit more elasticity or a little bit more willingness to pay whatever the market will bear. So if there's tons of other substitutes in the in the space, if you're one of a thousand different widget suppliers, you have less power in that solution. Unless you can share and show that you are absolutely the best solution and you can help them save money in some other way by using your product. Okay, amazing insights there. So I'm actually going to move to you, uh, David Chrysler now. Um, so from your experience, uh, you know, have you seen any other pricing type that have not been uh, discussed or mentioned so far? Uh, what would be your perspective overall uh, when it comes to different pricing type? And if you have seen any specific pricing type working with the customers or the clients that you have been working with, uh, and if you might have any other stories that you might be able to share related to that. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I wanted to go back to something Steve mentioned because I think it kind of ties into what, you know, how I want to answer this. And Steve, you had mentioned, you know, the sophistication of the companies that you're ultimately dealing with in terms of how, sophist how sophisticated from a information perspective. So what kind of access to um, data do they have to be able to influence those pricing decisions and pricing strategy decisions? I think that's really important. And, you know, I saw that firsthand um, when I had a corporate position and we were doing multiple ERP implementations for new acquisition facilities. You know, again, typically it was in a manufacturing space. We talked about cost plus being the starting point. And what we would see with these new acquisition plants is since they did not have a fully integrated ERP system and were typically working off of some type of uh, legacy accounting system, inevitably, most of those facilities would think, and I use that term very literally, think they understood and knew what their costs were. And it wasn't until we started to get them a little bit further along and fully integrated into uh an ERP system that they became more sophisticated, that they really knew what their costs then were, which then they could go and apply the cost plus model, which then they could go and expand to, you know, doing some competitive analysis and all of the other testing that, um, that everybody on the panel has mentioned. So I think for me, that's for sure a consideration, especially when you're starting out or you're looking to want to make some changes being able to understand the level of sophistication of information you have access to, uh, to be able to influence those decisions. Because again, back to you know what Dave Meyer had mentioned, if you're not monitoring these and testing these strategies, then it's really all for nothing. And you really are kind of putting yourself out there in terms of guessing and waiting for the market to react. The market will always be the final indicator of it, but you want to be making smart decisions and smart testing 
with the information that you have available. So by no means am I saying that if you don't have a fully integrated ERP system, can you not start to do this because everybody has access to financials and you know pertinent information. I just think that it is a consideration, the more sophisticated of a system and the more access to information and data points that you have, the more you can start to intertwine these strategies. And I believe the more benefit uh, you will see quicker from doing the, uh, from intertwining those strategies. Yeah, so some very interesting insights. And I have a story, uh, you know, to share with you guys related to pricing. Since you were talking about the integrated ERP system or the system, I have seen some crazy business processes related to pricing in a lot of different industries. For example, we I was working with one of the gas station client. And this client, what they had done is they had hired a bunch of interns just to monitor the pricing of their competitors. If you are familiar with the convenience industry business, especially if you talk about the gas stations, okay, the pricing is cutthroat. Okay, if your competitor is going to change the price immediately, you want to change the price. Otherwise, everybody is going to drive there and you are going to lose all the business. So these guys had literally hired people to be able to monitor the, the, the pricing. And, you know, that's how the, the pricing was driven. So I'm actually going to move to Colin and I'm going to ask him if he has seen uh, any specific pricing strategies in his experience, especially uh, if you have seen how these companies monitor their competitors in if that had any influence in terms of the pricing strategy that you might uh, want to consider. Uh, what's been your experience overall uh, when it comes to the, the different types of pricing strategies? Yeah, and you kind of specifically called out the competitive one, and I'd like to address competitive pricing if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and kind of focus in on the CPG space and the, the things that we buy every day in the grocery store, because I know these won't apply to some of these other industries. Um, but we like to, in CPG, talk about competition. Um, I think many of us hold this belief that when, when consumers are making a choice, that they are really weighing all the options at any point in time and, and thinking about price. And uh, when you get into the modeling and, and actually do the analysis what i find i'd say 98 times out of 100 is that competitive pricing is just not a variable that needs to be considered when making pricing decisions now i i i, I see steve nodding but this this would be uh considered heresy in some places to make this comment uh, that really what you need to focus on is your own pricing. That's that's going to explain most of the variation. And actually, you're take that one step. You're <laughs> preaching the gospel, my friend. I think we're going to get along well, Steve. So to take it one step further. Like um, we like talking about pricing because it's 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 sexy, right? We can make changes. We think we're influencing people. Uh, but for those for anyone listening that's in the CPG space, I would really press that. Um, distribution is the first thing. If you think about like we could sell, if, if we take that 10% price increase example, right? Um, maybe maybe you could drop price by 10% and sell say 10% more units. That would be pretty great. Um, but the reality is you also ate into your margin. So you actually didn't really make any more money at the end of the day. On the flip side, if you go sell distribution, you get into twice as many stores you're doubling your volume at the same margin. And so for those of you out there building businesses and thinking about this, get your pricing to a good spot, right? To a, a spot where you're happy with your margins um, and then focus on how can I sell more of this in different places. So maybe if you are online, getting into different marketplaces, if you're not just selling off your own website, right? If you can double your footprint, you could double your sales. It's really hard to do that through pricing. And then I love, I got a comment about that. Uh, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, if you see, this is, this is the exact reason why there's such a thrust in what's called omni channel marketing and omni channel provisioning. So I, I have experience with outdoor retailers who sell, they have their own website, then they sell the same exact product three or four other places and at different price points 
because they know that the price sensitivities is different and uh, and various levels of shipping costs or or free shipping because they know that's that's there's a sensitivity there too so i think you're right on there you know yeah and pricing i mean pricing's hard i know steve had that awesome example of like a 10 percent price increase is way more than a 10 percent profit dollar increase the number you had depending on your margin you could increase price by 10 percent and your profit dollars go up by um almost 100 percent. we see that all the time um by the way for that client that i told the story of that was a 500 percent increase in profit so their margins must have been like five <laughs> percent or something well, their margins were good, but their operating costs were too high. So they had to work on that. Too. Uh, uh, gotcha. Yeah, but, yeah. So. Yeah, when you can put one dollar, one penny down to the bottom line and, and, and you don't have to go through all those other filters. Yeah. All right, guys. So we are close to our time now. The only thing we can take is the closing advice. Uh, so Steve, I'm actually going to start with you. What is your short closing advice for today related to pricing? I'm, I'm going to say, take a look at all of these types of pricing. And if you are a manufacturer or retailer and you're looking, you do a lot of cost plus pricing, look at the others. And specifically, if you're a manufacturer, a sophisticated assessment of your pricing model can also get you looking at, I'm going to say, Goldratt's theory of constraints and throughput accounting and production, because your constraint is not what you think it is. It's pr you probably think it's in your building, like you can't produce enough because you need to hire more uh, engineers, you need to hire more machinists. Uh, most cases, that's not true. Most cases, the constraint is actually revenue. So you need to take Colin's advice, get some salespeople, and uh, double or triple the number of stores or businesses that you're selling into. Okay, amazing advice. Thank you so much, Steve, for that. So, Eric, I'm actually going to move to you. What is your short closing advice? Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with what Steve says, um, and I want to piggyback on that, saying um, if you if you have some exotic pricing strategies, uh, consider not only the, the bottom line, but also how you're going to implement those, because some things are easier to do than others, and some things might there might be unintended consequences. We want to test that stuff out. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for that advice, Eric. And David, uh, you know, I'm actually going to move to you. What is your closing advice? Maybe I can take a couple of sentences. Yeah, I, I think kind of combining what Steve and Eric both said, I mean, from my standpoint, it, it's don't be afraid to test. Don't be afraid to to even consolidate some of your current strategies. Eric, to your point, if if there are a lot of complex strategies at play, don't be afraid to try to streamline some of those and simplify it because every additional factor that you add in, depending on, again, how sophisticated your systems are, could impact you know your cost. It could impact the ability for your sales team to be able to do uh, to implement that consistently. Thanks, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, David, for that. Colin, uh, super short uh, closing advice. Yeah, so kind of picking up where David had left off, test and learn. It's definitely key so that you understand your levers, right? What are the things that we can do? And then pull those with intention, know the outcomes you seek, and then choose the actions that will make meet those outcomes. All right, brilliant. Uh, and thank you so much, guys, for joining today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. And we are going to be here next week with a very exciting topic and a very compelling panel. So don't miss next week's show. On that note, I really want to thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and insights. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, thank Sam. You. See ya.